I would recommend it to you as an average movie goer. I would. But for someone like me who I've been watching films since I was five, six, six years old and who has made films, talks about films, reads about films, is obsessed about films. Dune Part 2 is missed, but it's certain things were just missed. So let me just be straight. Should you go out and watch Dune Part 2? Yeah, you should. You should go out and watch it. Because it's a very interesting, dynamic story. And it's a film that I would recommend to the average man. The average film goer, would I recommend Dune Part 2 to you? I would. Do I think Dune Part 2 is an amazing film, is a masterpiece? Do I think that it's lived up to the expectations of what it could be? No. That doesn't mean it's bad. That doesn't mean it's bad. Because there are some extremely amazing elements in this film. There's some really amazing elements in this film. And there are things where you go, wow, damn. But as a whole, it's, man, what could have been? As an if they had really stuck the landing and they had done some things, we're looking at one of the craziest sci-fi films you've ever seen. One of the craziest sci-fi stories ever. Because the, there are story elements in here that we've never seen before in a film like this told on this scale. In terms of political stuff, religious stuff, conceptual stuff, philosophical stuff, there are certain elements that are so dynamic, we've never seen them dealt like this before in any other medium of film. But because a few things were not done, I was like, mm. so I'm going to just go, go through just my general thoughts on the film. I'll try and stay away from spoilers, because I just want to just give an overall thought as to why the film works and why the film ultimately doesn't work. And it's a bigger cinematic discussion because because this, is, this is, it gets real, it gets real because this may be my retirement vid because I'm already semi retired out of films. Let me bring that. Let me bring that. See, I'm already semi retired out, out of films, but this could be my full retirement from from films as a whole. And I will give my reasons why. Because so this vid we're, 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 we're going to go in. So let us first deal with all the all the characters and my thoughts. So. Timothy Chalamet, really, really, really good actor. Really good actor. And he's obviously the central piece in this film. Um, and you thought he was dealing with stuff in that first film. In his second film, things get taken to a whole new level. Things get taken to a whole new level in terms of what he has to do and the choices he has to make and what that means for the world and his future. So you're dealing with very, very big themes here. And since Shami, again, for me, I think this guy is really one of the best young act actors out there. He's a really good actor. He's one of the best young actors out there because I really liked him in the first film and I'm a guy who read the book. And when I read the book, this is Paul. Like the Paul I read in the book is this guy. I was like, you know, this is the Paul Atreides I read in the book. You know, so no, he was good. You see, this will go to a point where we'll get there because where he didn't do anything wrong, and this really goes to Denny Villeneuve, who is a talented filmmaker that simply doesn't hit a few crucial points based on the kind of man he is. Your talent as a filmmaker is one thing; who you are as a person is another thing. So, so, so it gets real. It gets real. So. Because for me, the acting is fine. Acting was quality. But when you just look at the character of Paul, this is not how you represent a protagonist or a hero. As in, it's a very interesting protagonist that does things that most protagonists doesn't do. Hence why I say it is such an interesting film to watch. Because 
it just reminds me of like, man, Frank Herbert wrote a crazy book. Like when I got done with the film, I actually forgot that, man, this dude, this is a crazy story. This is a crazy story. And the character of Paul is not your typical protagonist, which is what makes the story so interesting and so dynamic. But for me, I didn't feel like if you, it's really could have hit home based upon elements from part one and the elements from this part in terms of how you progress as a hero. And I'm going to get back to this and explain this more, but just in terms of where, because put it this way, when you read the book, by the time you get to the end, you're like, wow, this guy went on a journey. And you could really tell the story. Because I remember after I finished the book, because my friend gave, gave the book to me, after I finished the book, I was like, wow, this is like, damn. This is an amazing character arc. Oh, this is where he was, here, here, here. So by the time you get to the end, you're like, man, look at what he did. I did not feel that the arc that Paul went to felt truly end. You know? Because again, like, I don't want to keep comparing it to the book, but just in terms of his story, you should feel like if like he started here where he didn't know who he was, and then he slowly now comes into his own where this guy is like has just is on a whole other level compared to what he was at the very start of, of the, the story. I just felt too many bits were rushed. He took far too many leaps, and we didn't feel a proper natural progression of a young kid who was who didn't know anything and were just like vibing through who's now suddenly thrust into this crazy war, this crazy political conflict, and now has to now take upon a crazy mantle. So, but we'll, I'm, I'm, I'll get back to it then. I'll get back to it. But I don't want to go through the characters. Um, Zendaya, Channing. Good. She was good. I thought she was good. She was, she was good, you know, and she plays a very important role in this. And now, I think that Denny Villeneuve may have actually expanded the character a lot more than in the book. Because in the book, she was important. I think she plays an even major role in this. Because remember, if you think back to Dune Part 1, she's the first voice that you hear. <laughs> the first voice that you hear is it's hers. Because um, remember, like in Dune, the one that David Lynch did, if you, you, the first voice you hear is the, is the princess. Um, and I'm going to get there. I'm going to get to what I've said before. So... But yeah, no, but so so again for her, no, no real issues. No real I'm no real issues with her. I just felt, you know, um her, her role was very interesting because obviously she says like a love story with your boy Paul. And but she is at odds with how Paul is trying to be presented and how he's supposed to be portrayed. Um, with regards to his role within the story, but I just thought, but I, I know, I, I know, I, but I think I like, I did like her performance and what she did, and how she was represented. Um, but again, I feel that her character is very dependent on the Paul character, and I feel if the Paul character was handled and progressed a lot better, her character would have been amplified because their relationship is interlinked with who Paul is and how Paul is slowly growing into his own. So as good as our character was, it's still, for me, my big issue was, yeah, you're just sort of rushing things too much. And this is all combined with Dune Part 1 as well, where I had issues with that in Dune Part 1. But look, you know, she plays, basically, she plays a very key role and a very big, big role. And I think spe specifically when I get towards the ending of the film, it's like, whoa whoa, okay, it gets real. Like, it gets really real. It gets really, really real. Um, okay, before, let me, okay, let me, let me even go here now. Um, Raban, who had Dave, Dave Batista. Personally, for me, I was very disappointed in how he was rep represented here. Very disappointed, specifically from part one to, to, to this now, because I felt he could have been used a lot better. In my view, this dude was useless. <laughs> this dude was useless and this is a guy who should basically and this is where we're now going into like blockbuster filmmaking and the kind of rules of blockbuster filmmaking because when in the rules of blockbuster filmmaking this is a guy that you, sh you should remember this is a guy that after you leave the film after doing part one or part two you're like man Raban that guy was crazy man do you see what that guy did like he did nothing in both of the films he does nothing memorable 
And it's like, I, for me, Dave Bautista is the best wrestler actor of all time, easily. Like, better than Hulk Hogan and The Rock, who are horrible at, at acting. This guy's actually quality, as you saw from Guardians of the Galaxy. And I was just disappointed in how he was utilized because he this could have been a really, really memorable character and a really good side muscle character. He, he could have been. Like, I liken him almost to how you remember um, what's, what's, what's the um, Bounty Hunter, like like um, Boba Fett. Even if Boba Fett wasn't used well, this could have been a Boba Fett-like character, but obviously used a lot better in terms of the kinds of things that he did. Because this should have been a guy who should have been f fully antagonizing our protagonists and should have been a constant threat in part one and in part two. But there we go. Um, now, your boy, Austin Butler, who plays Fade the <sighs> So similar to Zendaya, I liked his I liked his performance. I mean, there were a few bits that felt a bit okay, that felt a bit awkward, but more so, more so I did like his performance. You know, interesting voice he used, and I just thought that the way his command of the character and how the kind of character he helped to create, I was like, okay, you know what? That's a very strong take. And that's a bold take. And I'm actually I actually really admire his bold take on the character as he tried to make it very unique and very specific. This is the main antagonist of this film. Like this is this is like our main like bad guy. Whether it's your Smith, Vader, this is the main kind of antagonist. And I felt that Denny Villeneuve did not really show us why this guy is like, oh, this guy is a real threat. And we'll get there and see how you should explain this stuff. But ultimately, he showed how well what he was, and I was like, okay, now, like there, there's a point in the film where. He shows where, okay, he is that freaking dude. Okay, this is that freaking dude. But for most of the film, I was like, why sh should I? Show, don't tell. Show us why he is that dude. Don't just tell us he's that dude. Don't just make characters say, oh, no, this guy's a real threat. No, show us that this guy's a real threat. And I, we, I didn't see in the film or in any of the scenes why, okay, he just did that. Okay, yeah, all right. This 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 guy's really the African dude. <laughs> this guy's this, this African dude, you know. So it's you know what? It's almost like Thanos against Hulk. Like when Thanos four pieced Hulk, you were like, okay, okay, hold the press. This dude just lubricated, circumcised, and devalued freaking Hulk so badly that he he made Hulk into a scientist. He, be, he domesticated Hulk. So already we're like, okay, Thanos, this, this, this dude is, is different. Look at what this guy did to Hulk single-handedly. And that's why that is so... What Thanos did to Hulk, that is a perfect show, don't tell. Um, but I did like his performance, though. It's just that I just felt that Denis Villeneuve could have presented the character, the, his, um, his role of the antagonist a lot better, personally. And... Um, very disappointed. Stellan Skarsgård is an amazing actor. If you've seen the films that he's been in, this guy is a really, really good actor. You know, um, very, very consistent. He really uh, makes it a bad film. Um, but in both these films, horrendously wasted. Like, he, this should have been a guy who you truly fear. Truly fear. And for both of these films, a scene here, a scene there, but you never really felt this guy's power and this guy's grip. Who just give it a small scene, a small scene, a small scene? Because again, for somebody who read the book, the Baron was a big deal. Like the Baron was a very big, and he was a constant threat throughout the book. So for someone like this, especially the role he has in this whole thing, you should have felt his real presence. Now, the damage was already done in part one where he was underutilized, but even in this film, I just felt like if he, he I just didn't, the, the acting was there. I said in Skarsgård, he, the acting was good. The look was amazing. The look they gave him was amazing, but I just did not feel his evil presence. And, we'll, and I'm going to give you examples as to how you present an, a constant evil presence, bro. Um, 
Evaluate Jessica plays a very big, big role. A very, very big role. A very, very big, big role. You know, and what's it called? Rebecca Ferguson? Good job. Good actress. Good. Good actress. Nothing like same thing with Zendaya. Good actress. Good acting. And she really got the character across well. Because the character plays a massive role. Massive, 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 huge role in this, like in the story. A huge massive role that is that just it flips everything. Like there's a revelation, you find out that just where it's a what? It flips everything you know about the freaking story. And I just think that, you know, what she what she did in the first film, but even what she does in this film, it's, it's shows money. Shows money, so shout out to um her, her as well, you know. And yeah, no for me, this was the character I felt was handled well. No issues with that, especially in part one and part two. I felt enough scenes, written well, conveyed well, all cool. So obviously some other shout-outs that I don't really have with Stilga, Javier Babadem, quality, really, really good. And I think he didn't really see much in part one. In part two, you see him a lot more great. Josh Brolin, quality as um, Gurney, did great as well. Um, so the so the emperor played by Christopher Walken and obviously the princess, I've forgotten the name, the actress's name. Um, cool, but I just didn't like the look of them. You know, again, when you watch the Dune film by David Lynch and how they present, I think it's Princess Irula, that's that's what a princess should look look like. This she didn't look like a princess to me. She didn't look like a princess. And Christopher Walken, amazing actor. He didn't really come across as oh emperor. He didn't really give that kind of emperor kind of aesthetic personally. But it's but the acting was fine. It was not too much of a big deal. So it's now where we now come into the overall thoughts of this whole thing. Um, Denny Villeneuve. When you watch this film, there are revelations that I have. Denny Villeneuve is an extremely talented director in terms of visuals, understanding scene composition, understanding um, scale. Um, just what he puts on the screen visually, amazing. Because there are some times where you just look at it. <sighs> just when you, you, when you just look at it, it's amazing. So you have to go get shout out to Greg Fraser, his um, cinematographer, who was also the cinematographer on the Batman film, Matt Reeves. The film looks beautiful. The cinematography is outstanding. And just the direction from a technical point of view is amazing. So he's talented. But talent is one thing. But when you're making a blockbuster, it's about who are you as a, as a person. See, when you're making these mainstream films and you're dealing with these archetypal themes of good versus evil, and more morality, it comes down to who are you as a person. And for Denis Villeneuve, I just feel as talented as he is on a technical level, he just does not understand the kind of fundamentals of this kind of storytelling in terms of how you present your hero, how you present your villain, how you present like your side villains, and just how you progress the good guy, how you progress the evil guy, and how you really represent it threats well, so the audience really feels the threats. Because as I'm watching this film, I'm like, okay, it's like it looks good, everything's well, but I don't really feel the energy from the good guy. I don't really feel the energy from the evil guy. They tell us that the Harkonnens are these evil people. The Harkonnens were bricks. These dudes got lubricated in both films. These are supposed to be these evil tough guys. Your boy, um, Gurney, um, played by Josh Brody, he says to Paul, man, these guys are brutal. I'm sorry, they, they were not brutal. Danny Villeneuve did not present to us why the Harkonnens are brutal, why they're evil, why they are tough, one of the toughest warriors out there. He didn't represent that. He didn't re represent that. And the way he represents Paul, bro, Paul was a freaking superhero for most of, 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 this, of this film, both of these films. So those things of how you present your good guy, your evil guy, these are just simple decisions, simple scenes that you do. Simple scenes you take as a simple line. A simple scene of like, oh, man, look at the way that he just destroyed that guy. Okay, I don't know that dude. And I'll give you examples. And it's and which is why I say to myself that these are two talented guys, Nolan and Villeneuve. They're talented guys. But they don't know how to make it a, an amazing blockbuster. Because when you're making a blockbuster... It's not just about the film looking good. That's one element. 
A strong element is how you represent your protagonists, how you represent your antagonists. Those are important things. So it's like for Nolan, I'm looking at the Dark Knights and Rises. This guy doesn't know how to fight. This is supposed to be a part to where our protagonist should be the, to the next level. Bro, I can't even see the freaking fighting. The fighting is trash. For Denis Villeneuve, okay, you've now, this now pulled to the next level, level now, but, and his fighting is good, but we've not even seen how he has progressed to that point. He's like, so it's a different issue where the fighting is well done by Paul, really well done. But how can he be a superhero from, from Jump, where this guy hardly gets beaten? No, you have to progress and build up to, before you now become that top guy. So you've got to take your licks, your beatings, be taken down before you're that freaking dude. And we don't really see that progression. And these are just blockbuster fundamentals that you need to understand if you're a certain guy. So which is why you come to your boys here. Your boy Spielberg and your boy James Cameron. Specifically James Cameron, really, because Spielberg, you know, he did this thing. You see, these are guys who, they have the talent, but they are, they, they are particular kind of people. So for a Spielberg or a Cameron, they understand, okay, this is what a good guy is supposed to be. This is what a bad guy is supposed to be. This is how he represents the antagonist. This is how he represents the protagonist. So when you watch it, you're like, aha, this makes sense. And those are things that don't just come from how talented you are because that's a technical thing. Those come from who are you as a person? How, how is your brain wired? How is your brain wired? Like when you watch T2, you're like, oh my gosh, that's T1000. Okay. When you watch T1, oh, that's T800. Oh, I know that freaking dude. Because there's a proper establishment of the protagonist and the antagonist. So I want to just give an example here. Going back to your boy, Dean. Um, you look at something like The Matrix. Neo was a guy from, was a man from the road in The Matrix. From the road. Like, remember when Neo said to Trinity, okay, and when Trinity says to Neo, like, look, you know, no one's ever done this bit before. And he says, no, that's why it says it's going to work. So you were already, already shown now how, bro, what you're doing is crazy. And it's almost suicide. And we were, see, we were told how strong the agents were but we're also shown how strong the agents were. They destroyed. They beat Neo so badly in part one, he died. <laughs> they eventually killed him. So he had to die and be reborn before he was now that freaking dude. But we had that progression of where he fought, he stood his ground, they beat his ass. Like Smith beat the crap out of him in that subway and eventually killed him. <laughs> you know, So he eventually died. He basically had to freaking die and come back up. So once we now saw Reloaded and he's now a superhero, the groundwork had already been laid. He'd taken his licks. He'd taken his beatings. And we saw him carefully and gradually progress to being the supernova that we saw in Reloaded, where he's now fighting hundreds of agents at, at, at a certain point. But that was end. For Paul, we never had that progression. We never had that thing of like, man, look at how what this guy is. So when he now becomes a supernova, you'd have, you've done the progression. Um. A great thing as well, Empire Strikes Back. So, first film, Luke hardly picks up a lightsaber. He hardly picks up the lightsaber in, in, in part one. He's just purely a, a pilot. And we just see the threats of Vader. In the second film, this is the first time he now fights the main antagonist. And this just shows you how you establish the threats of the antagonist and how your protagonist earns your respect. And remember, this was after, he, also was, he, he, he was away in training, but he obviously didn't finish his training. Bro, this dude almost killed Luke. <laughs> he beats him so badly, he almost killed him. So as you're watching this, you're like, God, this dude is different. So you now end the respect of the antagonist. And you're like, wow. So then it builds excitement because now as the audience, we're like, how is our hero going to overcome this? Because our hero gets beaten so badly. He gets, he's, he gets so colonized and so gentrified. You're like, Darth Vader, this guy is freaking insane. 
And for our hero, how does our hero beat this antagonist after we just saw him get destroyed? That's the how you properly establish the threats of the antagonist and how you properly establish your progression of your protagonist. This is just blockbuster rules. The, every hero must end his stripes. Every hero must fail. He must fall. And after he fails and he falls, pick himself up, regroup, train, refocus, and then he now goes back and faces his antagonist again after taking an L. Every protagonist needs to take an L. Those are the blockbuster rules. Every protagonist needs to take a major L. You take a major L, refocus, regroup, then you can get that W. If you don't get a W first off, you've got to take an L. You, every protagonist has to take an L. You know? And training. Every kind of protagonist has to go through this training regime. And my thing here is, you see, Dune is a different kind of a film. It's a different kind of a, a film and it's a different kind of a story. But it still has the broad strokes of an old school blockbuster, of an old school archetypal story. It still has the broad strokes of the archetypal hero progression. I told you, I, I, I read the book before I saw the film. I read the book years ago. And I was like, man, this is a great arc of a hero. And this is a great progression of what this guy was how timid and just how useless he was to begin with, and then what he now be became. So, in and, as, and you see this mainly in anime and in manga where everyone trains, and you have to level up. You have to level up. You have to level, level up. And you have to put in the work to properly level up. These are just these basic things. And I just felt that um, for your boy, you don't really see that. You don't really see that in your boy... So, look, like my prevailing thoughts for Dune, again, I'll come, go back to the top. I would recommend it to you as an average moviegoer. I would. But for someone like me who, I've been watching films since I was five, six, six years old, and who has made films, talks about films, reads about films, is obsessed about films, Dune Part 2 is missed, but it's setting things were just missed. Because I'm because at the end of it, I was like, this should have been so much more. This should have been so much more. And this should have really hit certain mass. Because again, which is why it's it's so frustrating because it's it's a crazy story. Because again, I forgot just how I forgot several elements of the story from the book. Because I told you I read the book like five, six years ago. And I was like, oh my God, I forgot all this stuff happened. I was like, what did this happen? This happened, this happened. So when you just watch the film and you just see the kinds of things that happen, you're like, man, this is unlike anything that we've ever seen on this scale. But for it to be a true masterpiece, for it to be a true cinematic masterpiece, you've got to handle your protagonist right, your side characters right, and your antagonist right all of your antagonists, and you have to present them in the right way. And your protagonist and your antagonist have all have to go on a certain arc. And how these blockbuster rules work is where the antagonists, these are the guys that are on top, and you establish them and you establish their threats and what they're about. So by the time you now get to the end of the story, and now the good guys now finally get their one up over the evil guys, it feels the end. Because they're like, aha, bro. Say, you know, this way also. Because the damage was already done in part one, because in part one, I didn't feel the Sadaka army were that amazing. I didn't, I wasn't shown how, I was told how amazing they were. I wasn't shown how amazing they were. I was told how brutal the Hakkanans were. I wasn't shown how brutal the Hakkanans were. And when you look at um, Raban and Fade, I was told that these guys were close. But I wasn't really sure. See, Fade, I was shown eventually. Eventually, you get shown. But you have to be shown from the rip. And you have to feel that effect. So by the time it now gets to the crescendo of the story, like, man, Paul, how's Paul going to survive this? We should, we, should, we should always be in fear of what's going to happen to our hero. Always. You know? So, um, I, look, you know with these films, it's always good to watch it twice. Because I think you need to watch film twice for it to fully crystallize. So this is after a first watch. So maybe if I watch it a second time, 
I'll be like, okay, you know what? This this is my second perspective here. But I don't feel my perspective will change that much. I still feel very well shot. Some very ama- some very good, amazing scenes mixing with again, Hans Zimmer does his thing. Like Hans Zimmer's incredible score with some amazing um scenes and sections. So and a crazy story. Like shout out to your boy Frank Herbert's a bloody crazy story. And even Villeneuve and John Space, they adapted certain elements pretty well in terms of what they, they enhanced. But overall, I don't come out of this I don't come out of this film in the same way others ask. Because I mean everybody will say, masterpiece amazing, masterpiece amazing. For me, I'm like, oh no, no, like there's some certain bits that are amazing, but overall, it didn't hit. It didn't hit the way this film should hit. Like knowing what the story is and the elements of the story, I felt that you could have it could have hit a lot better. And it's just about establishing your antagonists, establishing their threats, showing their threats, progressing your hero, properly hitting those key story elements. So, because how's the key thing? So, by the time you, by the time you get to the end of the story, you, sh- you should feel something. By the time you finish Return of the the Jedi, you're like, man, Luke really went on a journey. Because I remember what, how Luke was in A New Hope. I remember how he was in Empire Strikes Back. I remember how Luke was at the end of Empire Strikes Back, and now we now see what Luke was at the end of Return of the Jedi. Because I'm one of those few guys who says something. The Jedi is the weakest. But for me, Star Wars is still the best trilogy of all time. In terms of a beginning, middle, end, for me, it's still the best story. In terms of three films, trilogy, beginning, middle, end, that we've seen. Because here's the thing, though. The Dune book is in is in three parts. It's in three parts. So they make it two parts, fine, but it's in three parts. Now, maybe the second parts wouldn't really, there's not really too much to be done in the second parts, but... If you think about it's in three parts, that gives you a lot of time to really establish setting things within the story. So it's also said that should this have been three films? You know, should this have been three films? If you look at the first film ending at the war, the second film being um, now obviously Paul down getting in with the Fremen and everything, and also the third film just being a war movie, pure a pure war film. So you have two hours, two hours, two hours, you know. Um, but look, those are my thoughts, you know. I mean, obviously, if you guys view the films, I don't know what you think. I mean, I may do like a spoiler, re- spoiler review and really get into specific, because because there are certain things I don't want to talk about. Spoiler, but I want to just do like a whole non-spoiler and just really give my general thoughts. But I think, generally speaking, you know, Denny Villeneuve, talented guy, but they're just setting things you need to understand about this kind of storytelling and this kind of, of movie, movie making and this kind of, of, of storytelling. Cinematography and, di- and, and general technical direction, that's, one, that's only one element. It's an important element, but it's, only, it's just one element. Another important element is setting storyline decisions, setting character decisions, how you represent certain story beats so that once you get the payoff, the payoff feels ends. I mean, like, aha, this feels ends based on the journey. Maybe that's, I'll, I'll learn this, how I'll, I'll learn it out. By the time I finished this film, I didn't feel we'd been on a journey. Because I watched the first Dune film before I watched it. I, I, so I just went back and watched the first Dune film. So by the time I reached the end of this, I didn't feel we'd been on a journey with Paul. I, I, didn't, I didn't feel like, if, man, this, like, wow, we really went on a journey. See, after I finished the book, Reading the last line, I was like, man, this guy really, there was really a beginning, middle, end. We really felt the, the journey. And that's why, maybe that's why everything is in three parts. And that, maybe that's just how our, our brains work, where beginning, middle, end. This is how you start and how things now venture off at the start. This is the middle, where you now start to now begin to change. You morph into something. And now this, this is the end, which now takes elements of the beginning, middle, and now sort of now compats, uh, compartmentalizes everything together. So, but yeah, but look, tell me what you guys think. Tell me what you guys think and how you feel about it, but those are just my thoughts. And okay, if I was giving this a rating, 
if I was giving this a star rating, um, I'd give this three, three, three and a half stars. Three, a, a good three or three and a half stars, you know. Because um, I'll, I'll say, three and a half stars, three and a half. Like, now, that's over my first viewing. Now, if I, I may watch it again and give it a different rating, but after my first raw viewing, three and a half stars, which is pretty much similar to what I'd give the first film. Maybe that's no, maybe I'll give the first film three stars. No, I'll give the first film three stars. A solid three stars. I'll give this three and a half stars. Three and a half stars. All right, guys. One love, one love, one love, one love. Peace out. Subscribe and like the video.